Well, from the earnings season here and in the United States to another impact of inflation, the price of gold has surged 20% since last September, driven, you might imagine, by its traditional link with inflation plus an unstable world. It might also be a sign of an impending recession. And recession is the favoured view of one of the world's most famous gold bugs, the US author and financial advisor James Rickards. It's just one of the topics he's canvassed in his new book, Sold Out, released late last year. Now, for more on plenty of those themes, let's bring in here Jim Rickards, who joins us from his home in New Hampshire. James, many of uh, many thanks for your time. I, I really want to drill down into the real cause of the rise of the price of gold. You say it's not so much inflation. That's right. Um, it, and traditionally, gold investors say we love inflation because the price of gold goes up. And there's something to that, but it's not really the key driver for a couple of reasons. Number one, the inflation that we're seeing in the world today, and there is inflation, no question about it, and it's in Australia and the United States and elsewhere around the world, is coming from the supply side. Inflation, yeah, it means prices are going up, but it can have several causes. From the supply side, it's what we've seen since late 19, uh, 2021, um, you know, a supply chain bottleneck. Uh, the shortages of inputs, um, shortage of truck drivers, shortages of port capacity, et cetera. Um, and most of all, energy, um, energy prices, partly on their own, but also partly because the U.S. has, to a great extent, shut down a lot of the expansion of its energy industry and, of course, the war in Ukraine. So those were supply-side drivers. Now, you can have demand-side inflation, what's called uh, uh, demand-pull inflation, basically pulling demand forward, raising prices. That's driven by consumers. It's driven by psycho psychology. That's not what we're seeing. It's coming from the supply-side. And the difference is the supply-side inflation tends to kind of snuff itself out. If I'm paying double the price for petrol instead of, you know, $75 to fill up my truck, it's $150. Well, I'm going to do it anyway because the it's inelastic. I've got to get gas in the truck because I have to go to work or take the kids to school or whatever. But that means it's $75 I'm not spending on something else, going out to dinner, sporting event, uh, uh, the concert, whatever it may be. And so that kind of demand destruction tends to cause inflation to come down. And indeed, inflation is coming down. We're seeing that very distinctly in the United States, where it really peaked last July, and pardon me, it's been coming down ever since. I expect it to come down more. We're in kind of a stage of disinflation. So if that's not driving the gold price, what is? Uh, there are two things. One, just good old-fashioned supply and demand. Uh, central banks have been net buyers since 2009. That net buying is increasing. We're seeing it, uh, you know, Russia has been like steady Eddie, you know, 10 to 30 tons, metric tons a month for over 10 years. Um, they've tripled, more than tripled their gold reserves. They've gone from, uh, if you go back to 2009, about 600 metric tons. They're over 2,000 metric tons today. China, uh, but Russia has been very transparent about it <clears throat> until the war. Now, now they're in a war, so of course they're not going to tell us what they're doing with gold or anything else. I was going to jump in there because that's one of the big issues, clearly, and that is the war has meant that all sorts of reserves in Russia are frozen. But gold assets, they're much more liquid on the, on the global markets. China also, similar things. So is it one of these points where countries such as China and Russia are trying to almost wean themselves off any relationship with the US dollar? I don't think there's any question about it. Now, it's easier said than done. You know, sterling, uh, you go back to 1914, sterling was the dominant reserve currency, payment currency, et cetera. And by 1944, it was kind of an also run, still an important currency, but the U.S. dollar was dominant. But that's, that was 30 years from 1914 to 1944, so it didn't happen overnight. Same thing with the dollar. Now, now here, Ross, it's really important to distinguish between a reserve currency and a payment currency. Now, they're all currencies. But a reserve currency actually isn't, countries don't hold their reserves in currencies. They hold them in securities that are denominated in currencies. So when people say, you know, the dollar is 60% of global reserves, well, what that really means is that dollar denominated securities, primarily US Treasury securities, are 60% of global reserves. Um, but, uh, but a payment currency, it's much easier to substitute. I don't have to pay you in dollars if uh, we could have a new cryptocurrency. China and Russia could develop a, a cryptocurrency of their own and use it for bilateral trade. We're seeing this with the BRICS. You know, it's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. They now call themselves BRICS Plus. 
because they invite Turkey and Argentina and Brazil and a lot of other countries to their meetings. There's a Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is Russia and China and Central Asian Republics. Saudi Arabia is talking to China about possibly uh, selling oil for Chinese yuan rather than U.S. dollars. Those are very significant developments. I don't minimize them at all. But they're talking about payment currencies, how I pay you for things or you pay me for things in, in bilateral trade. Reserve currency is much stickier, much much more difficult to, to change. Um, and the reasons for that, because you need a securities market, such as the currency as the securities. You need all maturities from you know 30 days to 30 years. Um, you need um, dealers, uh, repo facilities, hedging facilities, futures, options, settlement, when issued trading, settlement, you know, clearance. And above all, you need a rule of law. Russia and China don't have that package, and they certainly don't have a rule of law. So they're not, you're not going to see a Russian ruble or a Chinese yuan as a, a reserve currency. Um, China doesn't have a bond market, not of any significance. I mean, they have a, a kind of junky corporate bond market, but not much sovereign debt. Um, and even if they did, who would trust the Chinese? And, and same thing with the Russians. So just jumping in there, the biggest producers of gold in the world right now are China, Russia, and then Australia as the third. So how important strategically is the gold production out of Australia, um, given the fact that you've actually got these rising prices and these pressures from China and Russia in particular, and these other countries, to acquire more gold? It's extremely important. Russia, uh, sorry, Australia is almost a swing producer. When you think about it, Russia has been, you know, subject to so many financial sanctions and bans. They can't just go into London and, and buy gold the way they used to, but they can buy it from their own mines. And you're right, Russia is one of the uh, top three uh, gold producers in the world. But they can buy it from their own mines, and better yet, they can pay rubles if they want to. They can they can print the money, and they are. Likewise, China can buy it from its own mines. Now, Australia, for better or worse, doesn't have that much gold uh, in reserves. Now, they they have a, a lot of gold in the ground. Uh, again, Australia is a major gold producer, but the government, uh, Reserve Bank of Australia, don't really buy any. In fact, they've been getting rid of it. So Australia's official gold position is weak, but their geological gold position is extremely strong. And to some extent, they're the, the swing producer in the world right now because China and Russia are buying up their own gold. Um, so everyone needs to get it from somewhere else. And, uh, you know, Ghana is a producer. South Africa's production has declined significantly. The U.S. is a producer. I doubt we're selling any to Russia these days. So the, the gold market is being kind of broken into pieces. It's, it's inefficient, but it is a, a good opportunity for an open market producer like Australia. So the interesting thing then, Jim, is just a final one. I mean, already 20% since September. Just explain to me where you imagine the gold price goes to over the course of, let's say, 2023, 24, with all these pressures on it. One of the key drivers is real interest rates. So the way to think about it, cash or you know bank deposits or short-term government securities compete with gold for investor dollars. Um, you know, I'm an asset allocator. I've got some stocks or bonds, but I might have some gold or I might have some uh, you know, cash equivalents such as treasury bills. Well, gold has no yield. It has great long-term returns through price appreciation, which is basically the inverse of a declining dollar, but it doesn't have a yield, but securities do. So the lower the real return on the security side, the more attractive gold looks. And so what causes securities to have lower returns? Well, high inflation uh, is one of them, uh, meaning if, if I have a nominal rate of uh, 4% on a treasury note, but uh, inflation is 8% uh, or even 6%, the, the real return is, is negative because um, uh, my, my nominal return is not keeping up with inflation. Well, in that world where, where interest rates are negative, gold shines, <laughs> no pun intended, but uh, zero, no, zero return is higher than negative two. So if I have a 4% coupon in a world of 6% inflation, my real return is negative two, Gold is zero, and zero beats negative two every time. I'll tell you what, James, thank you so much for your time. We've run out of time. I do appreciate it very much. Look out for James' new book, sold out, released last year, and James Rickards in the United States. Many thanks for your time today.